It's time to the three question warrant for Biochem 9. Let's get going. Which cytokines inhibit Th1 cells? That's going to be uh, interleukin 10, and that's going to be what's inhibiting those Th1 cells. Next, outline the flow of aqueous humor. Uh, so this formed in a capillary bed in the ciliary body, and that's going to go uh, further on and be secreted into the posterior chamber. Then it flows between the angle formed by the lens and the iris diaphragm. Then it moves into the anterior chamber and is finally reabsorbed by the canal of Schlem. Next question, what is the mechanism of action of metoclopramide? So this is an antagonist at the dopamine D2 receptor. It's also a serotonin agonist. So it will increase contractility in the GI tract and move things along. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. Before we get started, Dr. Lewis bet me 10 bucks I wouldn't give an entire lecture dressed as an ice cream cone. I'll show him. And a cherry. You gotta see what he wanted me to wear. I guess he has a thing for little German milkmaids. Or maybe for my legs. Then again, who doesn't? We just covered glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. And there's one more big thing you can do with glucose, which is to store it as glycogen. So glycogen is a huge polysaccharide made up of glucose molecules, which is how our hepatocytes and muscle cells store excess glucose for use later when you're fasting and blood glucose levels start to drop. Now the process of making glycogen is called glycogenesis. Glycogenesis begins with glucose. You have to trap it in the cell by phosphorylating it, by adding a phosphate group to make glucose 6-phosphate. So the two enzymes responsible for that were glucokinase and hexokinase. And you remember which enzyme was found in which tissues? Glucokinase is found mainly in the liver and the beta cells of the pancreas, and hexokinase is found in other tissues. So if we're talking about glycogenesis in the skeletal muscle cells, it starts with hexokinase. So these enzymes turn glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. And then from there, you're going to move the phosphate group from the sixth carbon to the first carbon to make glucose 1-phosphate. So this is different than glycolysis. With glycolysis, we went from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. With glycogen synthesis, we're going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate. The next step is to convert it to something called uridine diphosphoglucose, or UDP glucose. And this is catalyzed by an enzyme called UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. It's going to take that glucose 1-phosphate and make UDP glucose. So it's priming the glucose to be attached to a larger molecule. The enzyme that attaches UDP glucose to the expanding glycogen molecule is called glycogen synthase. Now this is the rate-limiting enzyme for glycogen synthesis. Glycogen synthase is going to make what are called alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages, which make the chain longer and longer and longer. There's another enzyme that makes branches in the glycogen chain, which is called branching enzyme and it makes alpha-1,6 glycosidic linkages. So glycogen can get to be rather enormous, so the branches are going to help keep the glycogen molecule somewhat compact. So you use alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 linkages. And that's basically how you make glycogen. Now, the whole purpose of glycogen is to store glucose for later. And when you need glucose, you're going to start breaking down that glycogen. And that's a process called glycogenolysis, so lysis of glycogen. So how do you break down glycogen? We well, have to break down one of those two bonds. You either have to break down the alpha-1,4 linkage or you have to break down the branching alpha-1,6 linkage. So take a look at number four in your study guide. Let's start with the alpha-1,4 linkage. The majority of glycogen is composed of these alpha-1,4 linkages. And the enzyme that's used to break down the alpha-1,4 linkage is called glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen phosphorylase breaks down the alpha-1,4 linkage and cuts loose one glucose-1 phosphate molecule. Then an enzyme called phosphoglucomutase converts that glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. Then the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase converts it back into glucose. Now, where did we see glucose 6-phosphatase before? Well, it's the last step of the gluconeogenesis pathway. And here we see that it's also the last step in glycogenolysis, converting that trapped glucose 6-phosphate back into glucose. Now, remember, we said that muscle cells don't have this glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme. That's one reason muscle cells can't perform gluconeogenesis. And it also means that while muscle cells can break glycogen down into glucose 6-phosphate, that glucose 6-phosphate is still trapped inside the muscle cell. So it's going to be used by the muscle to generate energy through glycolysis. So the only reason a muscle cell breaks down glycogen is for its own use. Muscles can't share energy. That's the liver's job. And hepatocytes do have glucose 6-phosphatase. So those are the 1-4 linkages. What about the branching linkages, the alpha-1-6 linkages? So the enzyme that breaks those down is alpha-1,6-glucosidase. 
which is also referred to as debranching enzyme. So debranching enzyme, or alpha-1,6-glucosidase, breaks down the alpha-1,6 linkage directly into glucose. You don't have to go through all those other steps with the alpha-1,6 linked glucose, so it's a little bit more efficient. And actually, debranching enzyme has two functions, so let me illustrate it for you. This is your branched glycogen molecule, and glycogen phosphorylase is cooking along, breaking off glucose-1 phosphate molecules one at a time. But when it gets close to a branch point, one of those alpha-1,6 linkages, specifically when it gets exactly four glucose molecules away, glycogen phosphorylase stops working. That's when debranching enzyme goes to work. And like I said, debranching enzyme has two functions. One function is called a transferase activity. Specifically, it's called a 4-alpha D-glucanotransferase activity. This means that debranching enzyme can take three of those last four glucose molecules and transfer them to another chain. So transferase transfers the branch to another chain, so the glycogen phosphorylase can keep working on it. Then the other function of debranching enzyme is the alpha-1,6 glucosidase activity, which we already discussed. So that's how debranching enzyme removes that last glucose molecule. Now let's talk about the regulation of glycogenolysis for a second. So we need to regulate the processing of glycogen for the same reasons we needed to regulate glycolysis and we needed to regulate gluconeogenesis. You don't want to be breaking down glycogen when there's already lots of glucose in the circulation, such as after a meal. You don't want to be making glycogen and storing glucose during times when you need that glucose for energy. So one regulatory mechanism is that insulin inhibits glycogen phosphorylase and stimulates glycogen synthase. So when you eat, and the bloodstream is flooded with glucose, the pancreas releases insulin to allow that glucose to enter the cells. And at the same time, that insulin ends up inactivating glycogen phosphorylase. So you stop breaking down glycogen, and it stimulates glycogen synthase. So you start storing whatever extra glucose you don't need right then. On the other hand, imagine you're at a high stress state, a fight or flight state, where you need to share glucose. Well, what organ shares glucose? The liver. So your body communicates a high stress state by releasing epinephrine and glucagon. These hormones are known as counter-regulatory hormones because they do the opposite of insulin. We've already seen that glucag glucagon stimulates adenylylcyclase in the hepatocytes to make cyclic AMP, and that activates protein kinase A. And we've seen how kinases can switch on some enzymes by phosphorylating them. So protein kinase A activates glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which in turn activates glycogen phosphorylase in a roundabout way. Don't get too bogged down in the picky details. But the bottom line is that glucagon stimulates glycogen phosphorylase and stimulates glycogenolysis. That's how glucagon raises the blood sugar. And epinephrine does basically the same thing. Beta adrenergic receptors are GS receptors, which also stimulate adenylocyclase. Remember S for stimulate. And they end up activating glycogen phosphorylase and stimulating glycogenolysis. Now, in the video on glycolysis, we talked about diseases that could result from deficiencies of enzymes of the glycolytic pathway. Well, there are also some diseases that result from deficiencies of enzymes of the glycogenolysis pathway. These are collectively called glycogen storage diseases. There are about 11 different glycogen storage diseases, but I only want you to be worried about four of them. The first one I want to discuss is known as McArdle disease, which is a deficiency in glycogen phosphorylase. So McArdle disease is also called glycogen storage disease type 5. With McArdle disease, you have accumulation of excess glycogen in the muscle because all the enzymes that make glycogen are intact, but you can't break down glycogen. You can't break down those alpha-1-4 linkages in glycogen. So the muscle cells fill up with glycogen, and then osmotic pressure from the glycogen draws water into the cells, and those muscle cells start to swell up, and they eventually lyse. When those muscle cells lyse, they spill myoglobin into the serum, and that's a condition called rhabdomyolysis. That myoglobin goes through the blood to the kidneys, and it causes myoglobinuria, or myoglobin in the urine. And then the myoglobin can also clog up the kidneys and cause renal failure. Patients with McArdle disease can also have muscle cramping, because glycogen can't be broken down to glucose for energy. But the good news is that patients with McArdle disease have a normal life expectancy. It's just a problem with the muscle cells. And again, it's because you're deficient in the glycogen phosphorylase enzyme. The next disease is von Gierke disease, or glycogen storage disease type 1. So this is a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase. Remember, that was the enzyme at the final step of both glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And also remember that skeletal muscle cells don't have glucose 6-phosphatase. So this is a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase in those places that would share glucose, those glucose-sharing, energy-sharing tissues like the liver, the enterocytes, and the kidney. So if these energy-sharing specialists can't share glucose, either from gluconeogenesis or from glycogenolysis, 
you're going to be prone to hypoglycemia whenever you're fasting. So one characteristic of von Gierke disease is severe fasting hypoglycemia. Now these patients also have buildup of glycogen in the liver. Again, your liver can make glycogen, it just can't completely break it down. So this causes enlargement of the hepatocytes and hepatomegaly. These patients also get enlargement of the kidneys. They get elevated serum lactate. They get elevated uric acid and hypertriglyceridemia. And you can treat von Gierke disease by having the patient uh, feed frequently. So these, uh, these patients need a fairly steady stream of dietary glucose. And then at night, you give cornstarch to prevent overnight hypoglycemia because cornstarch is going to be digested more slowly. The next disease is Cori disease, or glycogen storage disease type 3. Now, Cori disease is like a milder form of von Gierke disease. Cori disease is due to a defect in the debranching enzyme. So these patients can break down the alpha-1-4 linkages, they just can't break down the alpha-1-6 linkages. So glycogen can be broken down, just not completely. And gluconeogenesis works perfectly fine. So these patients have milder hypoglycemia, they have no elevation in lactate levels, and they have no elevation in uric acid. And the last disease is called Pompeii disease, or glycogen storage disease type 2. Now, Pompeii disease is caused by a deficiency of the alpha-1,4 glucosidase in the lysosomes. So a small amount of glycogen is actually degraded in the lysosomes. So if the muscle cell lysosomes don't have this alpha-1,4 glucosidase, some of the glycogen won't get broken down. And there are two forms of Pompeii disease. There's an infantile form and an adult form. The infantile form is more severe, so these individuals have very, very low levels of enzyme activity, so symptoms appear earlier, they appear in infancy. So the infantile form of Pompeii disease causes severe muscle weakness, cardiomegaly and heart failure, and then these patients have a shortened life expectancy, usually less than a year if this disease is left untreated. Then the adult form, or late onset form of Pompeii disease occurs when you have some enzyme activity, but it's less than normal. So these patients generally have no cardiac involvement they get gradual onset of skeletal muscle weakness, they get diaphragm weakness, and respiratory failure. So that's it for glycogen. I want you to go ahead and work through the end of session quiz, and then we'll go over the answers. All right, first question. What's the rate limiting enzyme for glycogen synthesis? It's glycogen synthase. And then for glycogenolysis, it's glycogen phosphorylase. Next, which enzyme converts glucose 6-phosphate to glucose? That's glucose 6-phosphatase. That's the enzyme that's deficient in von Gierke disease. And the last one, which glycogen storage disease matches each of the following phrases? So glycogen phosphorylase deficiency is myocardial disease. Glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency is von Gierke disease. Lactic acidosis, hyperlipidemia, and hyperuricemia is von Gierke disease. Alpha 1-6 glucosidase deficiency, that's debranching enzyme, and that's deficient in Cori disease. Alpha-1,4 glucosidase deficiency is Pompeii disease. Cardiomegaly is seen with Pompeii disease, the infantile type. And then the diaphragm weakness and respiratory failure is adult type Pompeii disease. Increased glycogen in the liver and severe fasting hypoglycemia is von Gierke disease. Hepatomegaly, hypoglycemia, hyperlipidemia, but with normal kidneys, normal lactate, and normal uric acid, that's Cori disease. Painful muscle cramps and myoglobinuria with strenuous exercise is myocardial disease and severe hepatosplenomegaly with enlarged kidneys is von Gierke disease. So if you know nothing else about these diseases, know those bullet points. So that's it for Biochem 9. I'll see you next time.